the time suddenly that I used to spend in the evenings kind of going over and above and finding candidates, I just couldn't do anymore. I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. I had to start balancing my time. I had to work with clients that I knew were, were committed to me. Initiating becoming a hiring machine sequence in three, two, one. Hey everyone, it's Sam Keenly and welcome to Becoming a Hiring Machine. This is the show dedicated to fixing recruitment by going beyond saying what needs to change and instead teaches you how to make the change. Today, we have an amazing interview ahead of us, but before we get into that, I just wanna tell you a little bit about the show. Essentially, we have shows within the show. Sometimes we have interviews with industry leaders like today and others who are shaking up the space and they're gonna teach you how to do something that they do that's helped them be successful or coach others in being successful. Sometimes we cover trending topics, items that recruiters are talking about or will be very soon and what those mean for them. Every Tuesday, stop by. We've got Tactical Tuesday episodes where we go deep on how to do something that's going to help you drive better results in your day to day. Every now and then we open it up for Q&A. You can drop questions over to us that you'd like to hear us put our take on. Send those over to us at podcast at loxo.co. And finally, you'll you'll get a mic drop episode from our CEO, Matt, every once in a while, where he shares something that's been bouncing around in his head about the recruitment space and really thinks that you need to know about. So enough of my preamble. Today, we have an incredible guest joining us for a conversation. So to tee this up, I like to steal a couple of questions that, that they use in, in their organization. Are you frustrated with the contingent recruitment model? Are you tired of spending time working on jobs that don't result in fees? Are you sick of working with clients who just they don't seem that committed. And are you at wit's end trying to predict unpredictable revenue? So you're in for a treat today as our guest has some answers for you and to the tune of securing over 30 million euros for those that she's worked with. So with that, I'm excited to hop in today's call with our guest, Louise Archer, founder of Retrained Search. Louise, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Sam. That's a nice intro. 30 million. I don't know when we published that. It was quite a while ago, though. It's um, quite a lot more than that, actually. I think now I, would, I wouldn't I would know how much it is. I really wouldn't know. But it's a lot anyway, in retain revenue. Yeah, so for sure. That shows it's really nice to be here. Thank you so much for inviting yeah, me. Yeah, of course. And actually, I love that you said it's it's quite a bit more than that now because it shows it's, it's like, you know, if it worked before and now it's really taking off. So it's more important than ever, if anything. Yeah. So... We touched on it briefly in this in this introduction to you, but let's call a spade a spade. The contingent recruitment model is is unpredictable, and now more than ever, mm. agencies recruiters really need reliable revenue forecasts. But a lot are hesitant to make that switch from a contingent to a retained model. So this is this is what you focus on. Like, was there an aha moment when you knew that something needed to be changed here, or how did you how did you approach that? Oh my god, yeah, there really was. Um, I was a contingent recruiter. Uh, I had been in recruitment for, at that time, I don't know, 13 years, probably a little bit more than that. Um, I'd gone from secretarial temps through to HR and professional services and then into engineering. I'd gone from kind of very regional UK-based um, geography to national and then international and then uh, into truly global Positions even spent a good few years over in in the US, which I really loved. Um, and there was lots of things that changed for me, but there was one thing that didn't change, and that was the contingent model and and how frustrating it is. I think to begin with, it's quite exciting when you're first learning recruitment, and it can be you know sending out CVs and not knowing what's going to happen and thinking, oh, maybe I'll get lucky is is quite fun when you're um, when I was young. Um, the longer that it went on for though, the longer, the, the more I started to realize how frustrating it is when you get really good at it and you're spending your time and all of your experience and expertise doing work to find and, um, uh, you know, identify and, and persuade candidates about your opportunity and line them up only to find that the clients decided, oh, actually, I don't, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to do this instead. Or I've had something come in and something happened. So it means that it, that's when that just it, over and over and over again just started to um, grind away at me. And I think the moment for me was when I found myself as a single parent, um, the time suddenly that I used to spend in the evenings kind of going over and above and finding candidates, I just couldn't do anymore. I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. 
I had to start balancing my time uh, with, um, you know, the other important things in my life. And my time became so precious that it was either I had to leave recruitment and do something different or something had to change with the way that I was working. I had, I had to work with clients that I knew were, were committed to me. Um, kind of strangely at the same time, the firm that I was working for were going through a transaction and the company that were buying, um, whether it was a company that were buying the firm or whether it was a PE company, uh, I don't, I don't know which, but one of them had said it was a mainly contract business and the permanent side of the business was a, a kind of a much smaller sister, shall we say, a, 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 a much smaller part. And the contract business was very predictable in terms of revenue because they were all on 12, 18 month, two year contracts and, and um, the revenue was predictable. But from a permanent perspective, it was all contingent and the forecasts were dreadful and, and they were so it was so unpredictable. They basically said, if, if you, if you can't, the, it's, it's worthless because it's so unpredictable. It basically won't feature in the sale. You, it, you either need to shore up that revenue or kill, kill the perm business. Um, so those two things kind of happened at the same time. So there was a bit of an aha moment for the business. And there was a, a definitely a personal aha moment for me that just fitted perfectly together. And around the same time, um, I met a guy in the business, a guy called Matt Howell, who I always say thank you to. And hopefully he's listening to this and he helped me say thank you to him again, um, because he knew how to, how to win work on a retained basis. And I was lucky enough to sit close enough to him to find out how to do it. And so I started, I started doing that and, and it worked. Um, and all the work that I was doing on a contingent basis, bar you know, one or two pieces that I didn't win, I convert, we converted to retained. And all the, the, it was steadily one step at a time, we converted the main, the main clients. And that just showed me that you didn't need to, you don't need to be working at executive levels. It wasn't a world that I, I could never inhabit. It, it, it was just a different model that can be applied to the same stuff that I was doing. And that was when I thought, why on earth are more people not doing this? I, I, why is it, why has nobody taught me how to do this before? Because I found it so much easier when you when your client is committed to you, you can put the time and the effort and the energy that you know you need to make sure that you reach a, a good result, the best result, in fact, that, that's available to you, and everybody wins. I win, the client wins, the candidate has a better journey. Why is why isn't everybody doing this? And so. Through that, I mean, if you want me to go on, I can carry on and explain then what happened next, or I can stop there because I think I've answered your question. No, this story is fascinating. Please continue. And then what happened is I started to realize, like, not only was it possible, but it was immensely possible. And there was just, and, and actually, when you start getting out to, to find out how clients are getting on with the contingent model, you find that a lot of them are going, oh, God, this is a bloody nightmare. You know, they're not having a good time of it either that you start to realize the opportunity is just, is massive. If you know how to do it and you know what it is and you know how to deliver it and you know the intricacies of, luckily I was supported with the know-how um, uh, with that. And I then actually went on to work for a search firm and a professional research firm because there's lots of bits that I didn't know. I was still kind of winging it with what, what stuff Matt knew and piecing together the other stuff myself. That the clients ha- w- were embracing it once you articulate it well the the firm that I was working for at the time that were hugely supportive said, well, can you just start teaching other people how to do it too? And so I didn't, I didn't, I'm not a trainer, so I didn't think that that was going to be possible, but we did. We put together some workshops and in fact, yeah, Matt asked me for some uh, training decks the other day. So, and, and a lot of them, are, the way that I teach it now is still based on uh, on on the way that I taught people then, it's a lot better now, um, and it's a lot easier to learn because I've learned and grown as a trainer since then. But they but they started learning how to do it too, and and it and it spread and it grew and well, in fact, the chairman of that business, who is now a non exec to many many recruitment businesses, approached me only a couple of weeks ago to say that he wants to roll the training out across his portfolio of businesses, but they do 1.2 million a month in retained revenue now, a month in retained revenue. They didn't do any retained revenue before we started doing that. That is insane. So 
it works. Like it works. And it, it's only kind of grown arms and legs from, from that, from people saying, you've done this, you've, you've obviously, now I want you to come and do this. And can you come and do this for me? And now it's a whole thing all on its own. And I'm really passionate about helping people to see the light as some people call it. Yeah. Oh, I can tell just by that story alone that you really do care about it and, and everything. There's so many rabbit holes that I want to go down with this, but <laughs> the the first one that jumps out at me is I'm, I'm looking at my notes that I was taking as we were, we were talking is when you start at the beginning of the story, one thing that, that really jumped out was, you know, you said you were a single parent and your time was really precious. And I was yeah. thinking about that where if you are contingent, it's all, you know, it's just like grind it out. How do I do this as quickly as possible? But you really aren't being valued so much for your time. It's a big gamble. So if it's, you know, if it's just you, if you're a solo shop or, you know, if you're early in your career, we you just need to get reps in, it's a great way. But as you do start to really become an expert or you have other larger responsibilities, families, other things to pay for, you need that predictable side of it. So the individual side makes complete sense. And then, yeah, from the business standpoint, I'm sure that was a huge enlightening moment for, for you all to hear. It's like, this doesn't really have value to us because it's so unpredictable that we can't even put this in with the acquisition. That's it. That's it. And one of the things, I mean, I didn't know any of this before. I bloody wish I knew it years before I did because I'd, well, I'd be retired for for certain already. Um, But you don't really consider the productivity loss when you're working on a contingent basis. You know, I over the years of working with um, lots and lots and lots of different companies, um, both hands on working for them and hands on as a consultant and subsequently training them, I kind of collect um, fill rates. And the average fill rate in a typical contingent firm is somewhere between 15 and 25%. Like 25 to 30% is really high on a contingent fill rate. Even at the highest level, 70% of the jobs that you work on, you don't fill. And that's like normal. That's kind of accepted. But imagine how much you could make if everything you worked on, you did fill, which is what happens when you weren't retained. You can either work half the amount of time and still make more money or work the same amount of time and make three times as much which is why search consultants are relaxed, wearing Rolexes, driving around in very expensive cars and contingent recruiters. Okay, maybe they've got an expensive car, but they never fucking stop working. Excuse my language. No, you're good. This is We, we don't worry about filters here with anything like that. But that's 70% unfilled rate is unbelievable and that's at the highest that's a high very high yeah. contingent fill rate so do you think that that in turn influences behaviors to okay how do i fill this role as quickly as possible instead of how do i fill this with the best potential candidate for this organization oh i mean on a contingent basis you you just it's fastest finger first you've just got to fucking do everything that you possibly can to try and get it and the problem is, you know, there's loads of problems with that. It doesn't give you a lot of time. Often you're in competition with other agencies. It means that you don't get the time to assess the candidates properly. You don't even get time to find out whether they've really considered the opportunity. And that's where a lot of it comes unstuck at offer stage because they haven't had the time and you don't really know whether it is something they actually are going to accept if they off- get offered. But you haven't got time for that. You really haven't. You haven't o- o- often got time to exhaust the passive market, you know, you can go as far as you possibly can, but there's a limit to how far you can go because it's too risky. If you spend too much time on it, you could miss something that's happening over here. You've got to spin so many different plates because you never quite know which horse is going to come in. So you've got to hedge your bets all the time, which means the candidates that are really difficult to get to that take a lot of engagement, normally the best ones, they, they tend to get slip away because they haven't responded to an email. They haven't responded to a LinkedIn message. They haven't picked up the phone the one time you've called them. But if you call them three or four times and you manage to get them at the right time, which you have got time to do when you work on a retained basis, you can secure people that you just can't get near because you just haven't got the time to do it. It's too risky on a contingent basis, which is why you find people that, that you know, you can't, that, that's one of the reasons why you uh, you fill more when you're working on a retainer. There's loads of other reasons. It's you get much more control over the process. Your client's much more invested and more committed. You're able to actually put a process in where um, you have steering calls every week. You're transparent. You're sharing your workings and you can drive it to a result. So what I find often happens on a retained basis is 
a client will hire a candidate that they wouldn't have necessarily hired on a, on a contingent basis. And the reason that they'll hire is because they get to see when you work on a retained basis, you're able to carry out a search exhaustively and be transparent with your client because there's no danger of them, you know, um, stealing that data and running away or, um, or going direct to the candidate. That, that just doesn't happen because they've paid you, they've commissioned you to, to carry the project out. So you don't need to be, you don't need to be careful about what you're sharing with your clients. So you work transparently and you work in partnership. You show them where you're going, you show them who you've identified, you show them who you've assessed and you show them what the outcome of that is. So they have confidence that the candidates that they've brought to interview stage are the best candidates that are available to them, which means they know they have to make a decision. Whereas on a contingent basis, they never quite know there might be something better out there. You know, so they'll pass on something thinking there might be something better. And, and as a contingent recruiter, it's infuriating because you're, you know but that's the fucking best candidate. Like you need, you need to hire them and you need to offer them this, but it's very difficult to drive it to a result when you aren't able to give the client the full picture of everything that's going on. And so for the, all of those reasons and so many more, the, the, the fill rate on a retained basis is 95%, sometimes even higher. Yeah, I mean, And you think about the productivity difference for you and how like, I'm a different person. I'm a completely different person. I'm more confident, I'm more relaxed, I'm more assured. I know where my revenue, we still do search work now because I, I don't believe in training something that you don't actually do. Um, and, and all the way through my career, I've just been getting more and more confident and more and more assured because I know if I do this, this is what's going to happen. From a revenue perspective, a process perspective, a client control, a candidate control. Yes, it was fun when I was younger, but it's that, that isn't fun when you start to get older. So not everybody prefers it, but I certainly do. Yeah. I mean, this is you're saying all this, it makes me wonder why is why is contingent still a thing? It seems like there's only upside for everyone to go to the one way. I'm sure there's there's nuance to everything. And if, if we had a contingent person on here, they'd they'd tell us all about the other reasons. But yeah, it's so uh, well, no. Can I jump in yeah, and go ahead. kind of answer yeah, yeah. that answer your question there? You're saying and, and to be fair, like that that was exactly my thought straight away. Like, what what the hell? Why is anybody even contemplating working on that model? But the, but the reality is that it isn't always necessary, right? If it's an easy to fill position, if there's loads of candidates available and they don't have to have the very, very best of those candidates, you know, if you're recruiting a, um, I don't know, a warehouse operative, a forklift driver, uh, that kind of, it, you don't need a exhaustive headhunting exercise, right? You can put an advert on field a response, pick the top five CVs, interview four or three of them, and then go for it. You, you just don't, you don't need to retain a recruiter to do that. The contingent model will work perfectly well when it's easy to fill straightforward or low level. It's only when it starts to get more niche, if it's challenging in any way, if it's maybe a difficult location or it's a, a candidate short market or it's a um, maybe it's like a, there's a, a, an unknown brand or the company's maybe got a bit of not a brilliant name and it needs a bit more work for any reason that it's a bit more challenging. Sometimes it's because there's more than one to hire where one is relatively easy, but when you need two, three, four, it starts to get a bit harder. Sometimes it's confidential. All of those reasons or where the contingent model hasn't worked, you know, they've, they've tried that model and it just hasn't got them where they want to go. That's when it becomes important, necessary to put a process in place that then will reach a result. Makes complete sense. And I always love, that's a question I was going to get to later with you is like, why, what's a common objection or why wouldn't people do this? So, so that's a perfect. Oh, loads. <laughs> There's loads of objections. All right, so we'll get into more of that in a minute, but you, <laughs> you were getting into, you converted a lot of your main clients over and I'm sure that this yeah. helped fuel a lot of what you're doing today at Retrain Search. So you, yeah. you probably have a framework, a playbook, something that you start with when you go about these trainings. So what does that look like? Like, I'd love to get tactical here a little bit if you're willing to share a couple steps processes you don't have to give us the full thing but just tease a little bit of that out so people can start to think about if they're thinking about making this switch what should they be doing or exploring the way we do it now is to teach all of the pieces of of the retained search process all the way through the sales process from identification of the clients that are most likely to be receptive to this in the first place all the way through to uh, the diagnostics of when it's necessary and 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 when it isn't and and how to diagnose if it's even appropriate through to explaining what you want to do why 
closing, pricing, proposing, um, objection handling, um, winning the project, and then through to from 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 start to finish on delivery, from briefing session through to uh, research, uh, headhunting, what to share with your client and when, long listing, short listing, closing the search, and opening the account for future business. We teach all of that because. What I've found is as soon as you give them one bit of it, they then need another. You know, you teach them how to sell it and then they need to know how to propose it, how to price it, how what the terms of business should look like. You teach them how to sell it, they then need to know how to deliver it. Because if you don't deliver it properly, the whole thing falls over and it's all been a complete waste of time. So our our pro- process uh, program teaches it all. But you can start winning it without all of that, right? And the basic concept of it, and and it's not just conceptual, it's um, it's the reality of how of how to get started with winning retained work is look for the look for the problems that aren't being solved by the contingent model. That's the easiest place to start. Granted, it, it means that the first projects you win are the hardest because they're the ones that everybody else has failed on and the contingent models failed on. But when you start solving your client's most difficult problems that nobody else can solve, it elevates you as a partner and then you get the opportunity to start moving up the value chain, providing you're clear about what your destination is and how you articulate that, which we also help you with. But just to get started, wherever you've got, and we've got a wheel of why, you've got um, niche positions that um, the the specific skill set isn't, isn't being understood or isn't quite being recognized and the wrong candidates are being presented or the quantity or quality of, of service isn't being delivered. You've got a difficult brand or an unknown brand or a poor, even poor perception in the market. And the client has tried to use contingent methods and it's failed. And they're not getting so any client saying, I just need more CVs. That, that is a great place to be, to be articulating. You've already experienced the contingent model is not yielding the results that you're looking for, right? For those reasons, I'd like to take a different approach on this. I want to instead work in partnership with you where some financial commitment from you is going to enable me to put in place a robust process and work together to make sure that we reach a result. And then put your process in place that will make sure that you reach a result, whatever it is that you need to do. If it means that you certainly need to re- retake the brief. So you need a thorough briefing session. Let's make sure this brief aligns with what exists in the market and remove all the people that have already been, been targeted. Make sure that the way that we're going to carry it out, how are we going to approach them, that you put those steps together that includes headhunting. It isn't just messages. It isn't just emails, that there's a stage in that cadence and you know all about marketing. So you know um, how, it's, how important it is to mix up those messages. In fact, we were just talking about how similar candidate attraction is to marketing and we find it exactly the same so that you're not just sending email after email but you're mixing that up with your approaches and the way that you attract your candidates and that you're putting in place an assessment process that's going to um, make sure that the competencies from a functional and behavioral uh, standpoint um, are assessed and the candidates can uh, carry out this job and there's there's evidence of them doing so in the past um, and that you've got a regular steering meeting in Um, and that you've got a timescale for the project, and that your process, you know, if you put that in place, you're going to be able to make sure that you reach a result with your client. And make sure that when you take that financial commitment, just as a rough guide on pricing, that a typical search is, um, uh, retained search firms typically charge about a third of compensation, total comp. So 33% of total compensation. That's generally at the executive level. That's quite high if you're only working mid-senior levels, which is probably the majority, certainly the people that I work with and probably a lot of the audience for you, Sam, I would imagine. Um, So it doesn't need to be at that level. It doesn't actually need to be any more expensive than than your current standard contingent offering, which for most people is 25%. For some people, it's 20%. I wouldn't say go below 20%. But it doesn't need to be more expensive, certainly in the first instance, until you get comfortable with winning the first few projects. Because you can answer the question of how much does it cost? And well, you'd be glad to know it's not going to cost you any more. It isn't about increasing my fees. It's about the financial commitment from you that enables me to put in place this process and make sure we reach a result. So the cost is the same. We're going to stick with 20% or whatever it is that your standard fee is. The only difference will be the payment model. There'll be 
um, a third of the fee due on, on commencement of the project, a third on agreed shortlist and the balance on completion. So typically it'll be split into three stages. And if you need to flex, you can even flex it again and put the, put the emphasis on completion and say, if it makes you feel more comfortable, we'll just have the third on commencement of the, of the project and the remaining two thirds on completion. Making sure that we were both incentivized to reach a result. Hopefully that gives people a few tips. Yeah. Oh, no, that's, I mean, I'm just nodding along to all of this where, again, I'm trying to poke holes in this and I can't even, I can't even do that. So I think a lot of it is just the fear of, of shifting the fundamental model that you are running mm. as an agency or a recruiter. It's, I mean, it's the fear of change, right? What you know is contingent. You don't know this, how it's going to pan out, yeah. how to yeah. work with customers. Are they going to accept this offer? Am I going to lose their business? I can't lose business right now, like now more than ever, especially. So yeah. Let's go into um, you know reasons that people don't do it or mistakes that they might be making when they try to make this switch, yeah. so they can start to get ahead of that proactively to ensure that they'll be successful. I think a lot, a lot of the people. I mean, everyone, everybody is slightly different. Everybody falls in slightly different camps. But a lot of the people that that come to me have tried to win retained work already. They're not a stranger to this. They they do have a sense that it's a good thing to do, and they've had a go at it. And some people have won the odd one. But it's never really taken off. It's never really, it's never really grown, and people haven't really grown in confidence around it. And the main reason for that is that they don't really know what it is. They've dabbled at it, and it's either fallen over in delivery. Um, so they've won a retained search, and then they didn't really know how to deliver it. So they've delivered it contingently. And sometimes that's gone well and that's felt like a bit of a fluke. And sometimes it hasn't gone so well and they've thought, oh shit, and then crawled back into the contingent shell and carried on doing what they're doing. Sometimes they just haven't really sold it because they don't know how to and they're just a bit frightened of getting into a conversation. They don't really know what the answers are. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes they've seen other people do it and seen that go a bit pear-shaped and thought, I'm just going to stay away from that. So I think the majority of reasons why people haven't already done it is the lack of knowledge. It's a lack of knowledge, which means there's a bit of a, a barrier from a mindset perspective and that holds people back. But I agree, like I could never sell something that I didn't know what it was. So that's why that's what we start with incidentally in the training. And it is the foundation of being able to sell it, knowing what it, what retained search actually is. So that's what holds people back. Um, mistakes that people make are. Yeah, winning it and delivering it contingently. That's one of the biggest mistakes that I pe see people make. Yes, people are worried about it. I think the other mistake people make is thinking that you have to kind of go cold turkey. You have to, it has to either be retained. We have to either be retained or, or contingent and there's nothing in between. And I'm therefore we're, we've got to stay with contingent because we can't afford to not make, you know, money. And that's not true either. That's absolutely not true. In fact, for many, many years, the firm that I started winning retained work for we're still doing a lot of contingent work whilst we were winning retainers. And that's fine because there's, there's a circumstance in which it's relevant, in which it's appropriate, and there's circumstances in which it isn't. So you're able, once you're able to diagnose it properly, you can then make a recommendation based on the circumstances of what the best route to go down is. So there's no need to say, well, it's this or nothing. I like that. And it's, I think it's so important that you think, I always say it's like, think critically about it first and really diagnose like you're talking about, you know, is it by jobs? Is it by industries? Where does it make sense to use which model? Who will be most appropriate for it? But plan for it. This isn't just a quick plug and play tactic. I'm going to switch over to this. I'm going to go all in. You have, this is a, a business model. This is a strategy you're making as a company. So you have to put the time and effort into the planning and the education for yourself to know how to do it properly that will dictate yeah. your success. And so, and everybody does it slightly differently as well, obviously, depending whether they're like you say, one man band or they're, they're independent recruiter or it's their own bit small business or whether it's a, they're a leader in a bigger business or whether they are the leader of the bigger business and there's several teams in, in the business. And sometimes people just want to teach one person and, and then they start winning retainers and that starts to become a bit of a snowball. Like people see them doing that and then they think, well, if he can do it, then surely I can do it. And I want to learn how to do that too. And then it becomes magnetic. And that works really nicely. It doesn't need to be, you know, everybody or whole sweeps of people. You don't have to change the whole business all in one go. It can just happen, happen slowly and start with um, 
you know, where the most potential is. And some, some businesses will start with a team of people that are ready for it. And that just means that the, the snowball's bigger to start with and, and the momentum moves faster, sooner. Um, and everybody does it slightly differently, but the, the key to it all is just starting. It's just winning. Once you win the first project and you deliver it, like that's when it starts to become like shit. Why did why didn't I do this before? And 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 I can definitely do it again. And that's when the confidence starts to grow. And that's when people around that person start to see, wow, that is something. There's something going on there that's special. And that's where we see the results happen. Whether it's just one, or whether it's a team, or whether it's it doesn't need to be a frightening, big, huge, you know, business change. It can just it can just happen nice and organically. Yeah, I love with a bit of help. I love it. So I'm a big fan of expectation setting, whether it's for myself or others that we work with. So if you had to put a rough timeline, say I wanted to start doing this today, how long should I think about planning for just, I need to learn this new model, train myself, train my team to starting to implement it, to test it, to when do I start to see more predictable revenue results? Are we talking weeks, months, quarters, years, just you know, high level set expectations with that? It's difficult. It's difficult because it does depend on the individual. So we teach a lot of people. We teach a lot of people and we see a lot of different people come through and we see a lot of people getting results at different times and different stages. For example, I had an email only a couple of weeks ago from um, a guy, uh, Scott. Uh, he's in food manufacturing. He watched the course, mod- modules one, two on uh, Tuesday, pitched on Wednesday, won the assignment on Thursday. Now that's fast, right? He must have been up all night. He mustn't have slept. But, and Tracy and Jason, they were very similar uh, over in Montana. I think we were in week two and they started winning there. They started converting their clients. Aaron, who has just been uh, posting in our community, he's on his fourth win. I think it's his biggest, uh, biggest fee ever. Uh, he's three months in to the course. And some people takes a bit longer. So it can be anywhere between a few days to start winning your first projects to a few months. Okay. Um, it really depends. Some people are like, and I find without wanting to generalize, and I shouldn't generalize between the genders, but generally we are different, aren't we? Women and men are different. The, the, us girls tend to want to have all of the pieces in place before we then go out and sell it. Right? We, want, we need to know how to answer every question. We want to know what each document's going to, what I'm going to need. We need to feel ready. And the girls like to get all the ducks in a row. And then they go, right, I'm going to go out. And then I'm like, wow. And then they start bringing them in. Like I've got a couple in my mastermind at the moment. They're absolutely killing it. Tara, Harriet, Debbie, they're doing so well. But they were, you know, probably four or five months before they started winning their first project. And then some of the guys, you just give them a few pieces and they go, fuck, right, I'm just going straight out there. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to have a go. And they don't know any of the answers, but they'll just wing it and they'll have a go. And so sometimes it can it can it can happen quicker with people like that than the people who want to be a bit more cautious about it and have all the pieces together. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Oh my god, that's so true. I'm I'm laughing to myself because so my wife and I we just had our our first child and she's over here before the baby comes. Thanks, you. So she's here reading every book, getting ready. You know, I need to know all the answers to what's going to happen when she's born, when she's two months old, when she's four months old. Like, what do we need to get ahead of? And I'm like, eh, we'll figure it out. You know, I'll read a book and then we'll go from there. So <laughs> yeah, what are, you, what are you talking about that? I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, man, That's this exactly is hitting it. a little too close to home. But I believe it where it's, you know, some people need to feel they know the answers to everything before they get started. And some people are like, I, I learn by doing, I learn by getting out there and trying and, and learn from failure, learn from success and, and start to tweak from that. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So that's what it depends on. Okay. That's what it I love on. it. Well, that's, that's really helpful for a lot of people to hear. You know, it doesn't have to be this crazy long investment. You don't have to completely stop everything, completely halt your business to learn it. Um, this was awesome. This was incredible. I'm so excited that we had this, had this conversation. So one, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to come and join us. Um, I so appreciate you sharing this knowledge. I know it's going to help to inspire some recruiters to start thinking about, should I make this switch? Should I start learning? Um, and really just help to create a more predictable model for their organization. So before we jump, any any places that you know you you or your team are sharing information, places for people to check you all out, follow along to learn, I want to pass it over to you. Yeah, loads of places. So we're on LinkedIn all the time. Um uh retrain search and and I'm Louise Archer. Hopefully there'll be a link somewhere to my LinkedIn profile. Uh YouTube, we release a video every week uh, on YouTube. There's loads of value. We give loads of helpful hints, tips, 
uh, on our website. We do free webinars um, every month. Uh, we do a free session, uh, master classes in various different parts of it. So people can feel free to do that. And if ever people want, you, you know, if it's helpful for me to come back on and share something um, for you guys that's in more detail about any aspect of the process, I'd be happy to do that, Sam, too. Perfect. Really I love happy. it. Well, you're all giving clearly a wealth of information for free aside from what you do with your program. Yeah. So... So yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of great places to learn. So um, thank you again, everyone. Pleasure. That's the show. This Pleasure. was a phenomenal episode. I hope that you all enjoy it. Until next time. Thanks, Sam. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone.